<clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 530 on January 24th. I call the Park Authority meeting to order. Uh, Virginia law authorizes the remote participation of board members provided that a policy exists to ensure that such remote participation is consistently administered. This board has approved policy 111. Any such remote attendance must be approved by the board as long as a physical form of the board is actually present. Bush, the remote participant, is able to be heard by everyone in the room, and the remote participation comports with the policy. So we'll start by verifying that remote participants' voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for the meeting room and a confirmation of their location. Uh, we have one joining us remotely right now, Dr. Cynthia Jacobs-Carter. Dr. Carter, are you connected to this meeting remotely? Yes, I am, and I am connected from my home in Franconia District. Thank you. I move that Dr. Carter's voice may be adequately heard in this location. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries, and Abbott is not there, so we'll move on. Uh, step two, verification that the remote participant's physical absence comports with the policy uh, pursuant to the Park Authority Policy 111 for remote participation in public meetings, I move that Dr. Cynthia Jacobs Carter uh, be permitted to participate remotely in this meeting because it comports with the policy we adopted and a physical quorum is present here at the Park Authority Boardroom, 9th floor, Herity Building. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. We can go right into it. Uh, Ken, you're up first. Call the Planning and Development Committee to order. And uh, who's up? You're up. Okay. Board of the board is to bring the the work plan team one more time so we can uh, we can get this approved. Uh, this is the work plan for the current year. We did talk about um, changes uh, to, to the some of the last meeting uh, that are going to go that are going to go um, forward after this year. So this will be the last time you're looking at a hundred and twenty page document. We're going to get this down to something more reasonable that uh, focuses on our existing projects with more information and more useful to you all. So, um, with that, we I have a really quick question. Okay. Uh, it may have been on there and I just missed it uh, amongst the 120 pages. But I was thinking about the, it wouldn't just be used for this, but I know the impetus was the Alley Doyle Awards on a, on our property. Is that kind of site selection part of this or is that somewhere else? Because I know we were thinking of doing it on our property in the spring of 25. It's um one of those projects that are extra. Okay. So that it's not on the list, but it's it's in still the works. going on. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Cool. All right. Any other questions, comments? Uh, if we have any that come up, we contact you, right? Hey, is there a consensus to move this forward? Yes. Okay. I did go quick. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Out in the field. Andy Miller. Hey. Hell of a day. Hell of a two. Don't jinx it. My name is Andy Miller. I'm in the planning and development division. I manage the building branch. I'm here to speak about a project in McNaughton Fields. Uh, the project is in Mount Vernon District in the Gotten Fields Park. Um, we developed in 2016-2015 timeframe. And what we're proposing is a concession restroom facility that was envisioned with those plans which had shown up as a dash line. We're partnering with Woodbond Little League, who has been a long time tenant, and um, I believe they've adopted the fields for a number of years. And what we're doing in partnership with them is they have uh, completely funded the design and managed the design of this facility, uh, paid all the permit fees and all of that. The Park Authority has come through and hired a civil engineering firm to design a portrait mm -hmm. extension. And 
We have the building permit. We have the VDOT permit. We're ready to basically do that. The existing pad had been envisioned for this use. It has stepped water, power, and sanitary. We constructed the sanitary force main from that pad to the right of way, but stopped there, which is why we're extending it now. Putting in thin line up in the purposes. Uh, remains of the 2016 development, a Massenburg grant, a number of proffers from Mount Vernon District, uh, a little bit of sinking fund money, and a sizable contribution from Woodlawn Little League, in addition to the money they've already spent on uh, the complete design and permitting of this project. Uh, the costs are laid out in more detail in attachment three. And that's it in a nutshell. Available for questions. Mr. Gorham. Um, one thing in going through this that didn't jump off the page at me, so I'm going to point it out, uh, is that uh, their contribution uh, by the time you get uh, um, all of their architectural design and the permitting and all the research and stuff like that, um, they agreed to and contributed $200,000 towards the total cost. And on here, it's showing it, you know, at, at 99. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's that it, it it's not showing it accurately here, but just so everybody knows, it was about 200 that they brought to the table uh, to help get this done. Uh, this has been staff and, and myself and the supervisor's office have been working on this for what about two years, three years now, something like that. So this is uh, kind of the, uh, the the fruit of a, of a lot of, of labor and desire, and uh, you know I hope everybody will support this. I will say one lesson to me. Um, that should be learned from this. Certainly, I have learned it. When this project was originally proposed, shortly after I uh, originally came on the uh, the board, we cut the snack stand and the bathrooms out of it to lower its cost to help get it done at that point. And in hindsight, that's a flawed way of thinking because when you cut something out, it means you're going to have to come back and revisit it someday. And unfortunately, when there's a plan in front of you and you cut something out of that plan, all it does is put a bullseye on the next, next ask for the people. <laughs> so they started asking for this almost right away after it was completed. And we had gone ahead and done it originally. So with the economies of scale and the lack of inflation from 10 years and everything, we would have done it to an absolute fraction of the cost of what it costs today. And overall, we would have spent less staff time so we could have done other projects and done it at a lower cost. So we would have been ahead to just come up with that money and, and get it done originally. So I'm, I, I have suffered through my mistake <laughs> or, 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 or my agreement to go along with cutting this project. And also the bathrooms at the central delivery, that exact like little monologue can be said for that. But the thing I can't emphasize about the, about the, the war about it is don't try to cut anything because the public is going to go, that's what we want right away. It's all identified. It's all done. It, it's all planned and they know what they want. They just, anyway. So uh, I uh, uh, request your support for this. Uh, thank you very much. Lesson learned. Yes, Mike. Um, have we already approved the Massenbrook grant for this? Yes. yes. Okay, so this grant has already been done. It's a couple years ago. But it would have been in grant, that other category. The grant, no, no, but but the grant was approved. Yeah, but you, how long ago? Two years ago. Twenty-two. Or something. Yeah, that so that actually was going to be my issue. Was I? I know that it wouldn't meet the criteria because right. it may be maybe list is ninety-nine, but it right. two hundred. It would. Right. But one thing that struck me was that as we're thinking through the master of grant pieces, I'm just surprised. I've always thought of them as being spent relatively quickly, and just. I think it's worth keeping an eye on if we're giving grants that then we're not spending into for two or three years to just, I, I, I don't, I don't know where that fits in the mix. I don't know how well, often it happens, but I had always had this kind of internal assumption that these were, but for this money, the project doesn't continue and we're going to go. And I just, it just occurred to me. And, and, and you fairly point out with the criteria that we will be, um, likely approvingly 
this was no longer yeah, but, fall, but at, at the time that it was done, this was completely I, within. I know, I get that, and that, that's... I'm, I'm not trying to be negative about it. Just, that's not my... What, what I'm... What, what I think is worth noting and putting a pin on, and think about is how many grants have we approved that the money has not yet been spent? Right. And and how long has some of that yeah. been? Is this lag normal or is it? This is this is not normal. Not normal no, this is, that's yeah. what I thought. We can we can tell you in three years, but it felt like not ten. Normal. So yeah, this this just struck me as odd on that level. So I just was making sure it was odd. It is odd. <laughs> No, I just was making sure it was odd and not normal. You're right. What would, would we end up about six months behind where we actually really wanted to be at this time? Six months. So yeah. it would have only waited two years after the grant. But well, we also had that sewer connection that we had to work That's through, true. which took longer than anticipated as well. The grant was also used to memorialize the agreement between the parties. Right. The, just, just Point negative, good. yeah. We'll find out. I was just making sure it was an oddity and not a normality. Any other questions? The consensus to move this forward? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, we took up all that time. I thought we were going to be ahead. It's good. We filled oh, that space. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> With that said, uh, Planning and Development Committee is hereby adjourned. When would you're up? All the uh, operations committees to order. Talk about uh, what we just mentioned in the last meeting. Ask for grant stuff. And, uh, I don't want to turn it over to Kim, but I just think she's going to turn it over to somebody else. Good evening, everyone. Kim Eckert, Division Director of Park Operations. Uh, tonight, we just have one item for your consideration. So, with that, I will turn it over to Julie Gahan. Uh, who has very successfully managed our mass and book program in this recent review. Good evening, members of the board. This presentation will briefly go over the action that we're recommending at this time. The mass and book grant program has resulted in the events stated in the You'll remember this slide, which breaks down the last 10 years of grant projects by grant project providers and project costs. The discussion is centered around the concept of max money project costs as a new criterion for grant eligibility. The thought was to refocus the master work on its original intent of encouraging community investment in smaller projects. The action we're asking the board to approve this evening is twofold. First, we're recommending a $100,000 cap on project costs for the mass and book grant eligible. For larger projects estimated to cost more than $100,000, funding proposals may still be submitted to the Park Foundation. Secondly, we're asking the board to lift the temporary hold on applications. Staff are prepared to update the website and begin accepting applications again as early as this week, assuming the board approves. So that's it. We appreciate your consideration. We've obviously talked about this quite a bit in previous meetings. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? I, I would just make a comment that if we find out that we're not expending the Master Book funds as much as, as rapidly as we would uh, um, think they could be used, uh, that we might want to think in the future about taking another look in terms of, of, of increasing the amount or something of that nature or that, a, a, a higher match. That language that we talked about at the last board meeting, like put in a little review right. uh, sentence in there. Uh, if you read through it, that sentence is actually there. That is encouraging us, well, not encouraging, stating that we expect to revisit it with time. And, uh, you know, the most obvious thing is that. Yeah, 100,000 uh, but I'll the slide a bit here so now. So we'll be obviously reviewing that about going forward. But that sentence was, my memory wasn't broad enough that it kind of was inclusive of us of all things. And I did have one thing. I'm going to be annoying about something that I've been harping on 
this whole process because I didn't <laughs> see it. <clears throat> I didn't. It's not here, and I didn't see it in the board item itself. I just want to make sure, for the record, even if it's not in the document itself, oh, okay. that when these projects do come before us, there will be mm -hmm. that. Yes, I feel like you don't. You, we need to work well, on it. You don't believe that I when it when projects well, come in, you're going to be working. It's, it's not, not on paper. Road. It's not on paper. But we're, what we're going to be bringing is for those of us that can't complete each of y'all's sentences. <laughs> can can, <laughs> can we know what you're talking about? <laughs> One signature. Let me see. So well, maybe if I so we want to make sure that with the Massenburg brands when it comes in, uh, we look at it through a process lens. And what we're working on right now is instead of doing it by like the work program and the mass and brook and a whole bunch of stuff we're going to be working on as we're going, moving forward with the cip and other planning studies to have a slide that you guys will see in all decision making that puts all of the actionable items into a proso lens so when you see a closed session for an acquisition or the work program so you, that'll be a separate item that will bring the proso lens and then once we approve that, you guys look at that slide and you guys, it's something, it's all the information that you need on that slide. Then every time we bring something, we'll have that slide in the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Comments. I believe you now. Okay. Any other comments? Yes. Do you consensus to move this forward? Yeah. Yes. Does anybody else, does anybody have any uh, other issues with no, the Park Operations Committee? Yeah. Seeing none, I adjourn the Park Operations Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Michael? And I have no idea who's presenting this, so I'll call the Park Services Committee. Josh. Okay. <laughs> they know who will present. Well, I figured. I just... Sure. Um, I'll call it to order and hand it over. Good evening, Josh. <laughs> so we're here tonight uh, with an information item on a proposed uh, merger between the Red Pack program and the Kansas Red Pack program. Uh, uh, so quick uh, background here, Red Pack program. Uh, it's a six-week structured recreation program. This is operated by us, by the Park Authority. Uh, it is a general fund program, so we fund things coming from the county general fund. Uh, and last year, you know, we served about 3,500 individuals across the county. It's in elementary schools uh, across the county. At the same time, operated by Neighborhood and Community Services is the Camp Fairfax program. Uh, similar ages, similar program, held across elementary schools and community centers, uh, but operated by neighborhood community services. So for the last several months, staff from FCPA and NCS have been coming together to evaluate the right back program um, and beginning to actively collaborate on operations <clears throat> and the similarities in the program, the similarities as well as served. Um, and based off this work and those similarities, uh, RECPAC will be proposed to merge with Camp Fairfax and shift from the Park Authority to NCS. Uh, again, this is a general fund program, so uh, pending approval by the Board of Supervisors, this action would occur in part 25 at Y25 budget process. Um, what are some of the reasons? You know, I mentioned the programs are very similar. They're six weeks long, they're in elementary schools across the county, they're serving similar audiences. It's a lot of confusion in two programs uh, being operated by two different agencies. So some of the benefits here, uh, MCS, Neighborhood and Community Services, has a full-time staffing model. We don't have that model with the recommended program. It's seasonal or non-merit staff who are operating uh, and, uh, providing the staffing for, for that program. Longer operating hours. Our operating hours are uh, uh, 8.30 to 4 uh, versus a 7.30 to 6 p.m. option for neighborhood service. They have fee forgiveness options that we don't have. They've got funding for field trips and experiences that we haven't been able to do for Red Pack participants for a while. Uh, and then as I mentioned earlier, of course, some areas of the program, trying to reduce some of the customer confusion between the camp options that exist across the campus. Summer 
what the job said, we've been working with NCS closely on trying to identify some areas where we could merge our programs as much as possible this upcoming summer. So um, one of the things um, that will remain the same is our hours we identify that we cannot operate longer um, like they do until the program fully goes over to them. The park authority will remain with this program for this upcoming summer, um, and then the transition will happen after this summer of 2024. Um, a big thing is lunches will be provided to all the sites. The funding for that will be provided by NCS. So we're working with them closely on making sure every site in the past when a few of our sites were able to get free lunches. Um, we also increased our fees slightly um, so that the hourly rate is closer to what the NCS hourly rate is, um, but still providing our site scale. Um, and then our registration timeline. In the past, we were late April when we started registering for Rec Pack. We moved it up to March 12th, um, which is the same time frame as when Camp Fairfax does their registration. Um, and then just a few other things. We're working closely with them to do some cross training. Um, we work together to identify which location, which school locations we would be at this summer, making sure that we both had equal um, sites in each. Um, area of the county, and then um, aligning on supplies, uh, warehouse, and our techniques that we offer will be very similar. So it will look like more of a similar program. And uh, as I said before, summer 2025, um, we will fully shift the Red Pack program over to NCS after this summer of 2024. So we fall, um, but we'll still be heavily involved with them. Um, we wanted to partner with them for field trips, maybe coming to some of our park sites, the water mine. Um, and then last summer, we offered some specialty vendors through our vendor camps um, at the site. So we want to do something like that still with them, um, working with them staffing wise, training wise, just making sure that we still are very connected to the program and offering what we can for our students. I think the big thing with this, you know, the goal was really how can we best serve the individuals that we're, we're currently serving today with two different divisions and looking at the similarities of this program, what makes the most sense uh, for the long-term operation. And some of those similarities that uh, in between the two programs, but then the differences from a funding and staffing standpoint and the resources available, how we can best serve the entire community, collaborate over schools, you know, historically every year it's a who's going to get these schools versus these schools and how we work that out as opposed to one group that can better serve the entire community and pick the schools based off of, again, the focus on meeting the community needs and serving the individual. So that's the lens with which we've been reviewing that for the last number of months here. Um, again, this is you know beginning to work its way or will begin to work its way through the, the board supervisor's budget process as part of the uh, FY25 um, uh, budget process. Uh, tonight, I think we're looking for the endorsement as that continues to, to move forward uh, through that process. But happy to answer any questions. To, yeah, so just before, um, and we put the slide out on just as Carla Bruce walked in the door, just to butter her up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, when you're going to hear from uh, our big presentation on equity in a little bit. And this really answers that question of what else are you doing? And when we keep talking about how it's not just the one thing, that's the big rock that we had to do. We are looking across, you know, the whole thing about how we can serve um, the community. Well, whether or not it's us getting resources or resources going over to um, NCS, what this really does do is it allows one entity to be very strategic and targeted when it comes to providing this camp, especially for our lower income residents. We're not competing with each other like we normally are for schools. Um, we can look at targeted audiences and one entity can say, we want to camp here, here, and here, and there's no horse trading that needs to, um, to go back and forth. And um, we're really leaning into what we do best. We do camps the best also, but really is to let's bring them into our parks. Let's get them to be able to experience um, all the kids to be able to experience everything that the FCPA uh, a has to offer. And that's, this is really that one. So I don't look at it as it shifting the program the programmatic part is shifting, but we really want to integrate to make sure that, you know, all of the kids in this, in Camp Fairfax gets to come to Huntley Meadow and Watermine and, you know, um, Frying Pan Farm Park. 
So, so the first, I think, just to right size the, the the conversation a little bit, um, you you just said something about hoping to get an endorsement or whatever. This this is an information item. This is not an action item. It will not. Be, it it will never be an action item on our on our agenda before the board as a whole. Um, it's an information item in that this is general fund money, general fund budget that the board of supervisors and through this process has has working with with parkway staff and county staff has come to the conclusion that this is the best direction of how to use those general fund dollars. So this isn't a oh wait we want to use our budget to go do X Y Z. This is this is an information process that I'm sure the board want, the board of supervisors wants to hear back from us. But just to make it clear that there, there isn't going to be a proactive vote at any point from us on this. So I just wanted to right size that conversation before Linwood recognizing you. <laughs> uh, two questions. Who initiated this change? It was a cumulative conversation. So really what initiated this conversation was, and I'm going to speak on, you know, early on when I first started um, equity came up a lot. And so we had this equity group. And so it was Carla, me, Lloyd from NCS. I don't know, does everyone know who Carla is? Sorry, Carla Bruce. Sorry, yeah, Carla Bruce, Bruce is our <laughs> equity officer, the county <laughs> equity officer. If you don't know who Carla Bruce is, you should. Um, so Carla Bruce, the equity officer, um, Lloyd from um, NCS director, uh, Michael Beckett's um, DFS d director, and, and Chris Lennon. And so we would just sit in a room once every couple of weeks and just talk about equity, like not in terms of the silos or what agency, like what, where do we need to go? And so this was one of the things that came up as we really need to reconcile this tale of two um, park systems. So I can't identify this was in no way, you know, Carla coming to us and saying we're taking or, or the county coming to us and saying we're taking rec back. It really was an iterative conversation that landed us where we we are now. It really was everybody saying that this is the best way to go. And just the second question, uh, how much of a, 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 a general fund budget transfer do we expect this to be? In other words, what, what do we get reimbursed right now to produce rec pack as 1. we are? 1.2 1. 1. 2. 1. 2 million. Thank you. It, 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 it does make sense, big picture, to not have two competing agencies within the county uh, to do that. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's always <laughs> it's entirety. But I think it was I'll, that. I'll or, I think we've it, we. I think if you talked to us, if we had this conversation a couple of years ago, it probably would have been fifty fifty. I think it's it, one of the things that took it over was over the edge was um, NCS going to a full time SAC model. So the SAC, which is the after school program, there they were con um, part time employees before, and then they went to a full time model. So then the SAC employee, the full time SAC employees, do SAC during the school year, and then they do Camp Fairfax in the summer. So that model made it shifted it over to well, that's you know you have full time staff. Are there any other questions? Yeah, does it does it very little to do with the item before us, but just more <laughs> more with are we this is one of what I imagine could be a number of things we could be streamlining with NCS about are those conversations getting beyond this? Yeah, be, well beyond. We are having, you know, this we are I always talk about rocks in the bucket and we always do the big rock first, mm -hmm. you know, where we can get to with this is we are no longer competing. So we need to be working on having one stop shop for our parents to go to one location to see where they're going to have camps. Now that it could be NCS camp, it could be our camp. They're not, they're no longer the same. It's a different experience. You can go to Camp Fairfax for four weeks and then maybe go do, you know, farmhands camp. And then, you know, it's, it's so that, and then, um, the field trips that we were talking about, you know, we're talking about increasing capacity. This tied in with the, the presentation you're gonna see in a little bit, helps to blurry the blur the line, put us put us into where our strengths are, but also blur the lines a little bit that allows us to go outside of sort of what we have defined as our box because of our revenue fund. So maybe have camps at a, a community center, maybe go out, we just Sully did that um, with the Sully Community Center where that we had camps at a Sully Community Center in the summer. So we really, are working on doing a whole lot of of things, especially with NCS. Anything else? Any other questions? 
All right. Hearing none, thank you. And we're adjourned. Man, we're ahead. Jonah, you're good luck. We haven't been close to on time in like 12 months. Now we're like 20 seconds. 12 months. One 20 minute. seconds. There's, a, there's one, one. Wonder, wonder what the consistency is. Wonder what the consistency is. What? I'm not saying. I'm not saying. All right. It's straight. straight. Don't run on time like they used to. But, all right. I'd like to call the order the Communications and Community Engagement Committee and turn it over to our director. So, uh, if I could invite Carla and our um, consultant Stan to come on up. You can bring that. Is that is everybody's got black chair? Uh, uh, who are you? There. Yes. Instead of that crappy chair. Wow. I shouldn't say crappy on. It's a perfectly lovely chair. We spent all this money for the nice black chairs. We might as well. We, br we bring in guests. Let them sit in the work. nice furniture. Have to hold out stuff. <laughs> it's a good thing some of the board members aren't here. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to begin to say this is a long um, time coming. We've been more, if you uh, remember, we started this journey um, about a year or so ago and it's not ending here, but talking about um, equity and the revenue fund. We took a presentation to the HHS committee. Um, we uh, The board of supervisors funded an equity study and we hired HRNA, um, of which Stan is named partner. I always get this wrong, name par partner. Managing partner, thank you. I don't want to give you the motion, of which Dan is a managing um, partner. And so, um, again, like the um, conversation surrounding Rec Pack and um, Camp Fairfax, this was also a very iterative, collaborative process, um, which is why we're uh, graced with um, uh, Carla from who was our equity officer. And so, the way we're gonna, um, Stan's gonna go over the um, the. Um, equity study, the results from the equity study, but we thought we'd frame it a little bit and invite Carla to sort of talk about a little bit of how we got to where we are. So turn it over to Carla. Good evening, everyone. Um, they have already introduced me, um, <laughs> but I'm really excited to be here. I'm, um, I've been in my role as chief deputy officer in the county now for about five and a half years. And um, when I, know, I've been here before to talk to the board about the concept of equity, um, but it's really now about sort of where do we see inequity and where are we actively addressing it and where are we um, aligning and, and adjusting our systems and strategy to, um, to eliminate inequity and which departments, you know, are doing that work. And so I just want to first start by saying I am very thankful to the leadership and the overall leadership of the Park Authority in terms of, you know, taking that charge to become one Fairfax and really, you know, um, investigating and interrogating and thinking about the work of the organization and the outcomes that you all seek to achieve from an equity perspective. Um, when we do this work, you know, we, we definitely want to look at things that need to change um, and sort of where we want to be. So, the, you know, I talked about the, the principles are you start by saying, you know, are we fine with our current um, structural arrangement? Are we, are we okay with our current outcomes? Um, are our systems working the way that we want them to? And if not, where can we make change? But in order to make that change, we have to start with a look at history and figure out how we got to the situation, as well as to look at the root causes of which generating the change, right? Because we can see a change, but we don't necessarily know what's driving that change. And one of the things that's been um, just really enlightening about the work we've been doing is that we took that time to look at history. And there's a slide before you, and I won't go through um, you know, each of these points, but you know, we just have to be frank about how our system came to be. And uh, and so, you know, a lot of the development of the county overall um, and the creation of the systems that we are responsible for managing now, the time period in which they were evolving was a time when 
um, in our country and in our community, um, there was a a couple of things happening. One, there was um, you know this move to segregate, um, and that you know communities were segregated, resources were segregated, people were segregated, and so our systems were created during that time. Um, the other thing to, to think about is who was participating in the process of creating this thing, these things. It wasn't necessarily an inclusive uh, process. And so the people who were doing the planning and making the decisions were making decisions, not necessarily taking into account the interests of, of all people. And so one of the things that's um, that's striking and that we, you know, sort of found evidence of in our research really lines up with the national history that we know. Um, that, you know, there were um, uh, facilities in the park authority that were segregated. There were, um, you know, how certain um, park authority spaces came to be was because certain communities were being evacuated, right? They were being displaced. And so it's a very complicated history. We're not going to go into it tonight. But what it tells us is if that, that the system was created on a certain set of values, do we still hold those values today? And I would say from my experience and what the evidence is that I see is that we don't. And so if the system is producing results based on being created during a time period that just is inconsistent with where we are today, then we should do some of that unpacking. And I think, um, you know, what we've done by doing this historical book is that we, um, you know, we've seen sort of how some of these things get created. There was a real intersecting, you know, the previous presentation, um, Related to the transition of of rec pack, um, you know, really speaks to the continually intersecting relationship between the park authority and what is now neighborhood and community services. So I'm a former employee of neighborhood and community services. Um, so it was once community and recreation services. It was once recreation and community services, and um, a lot of their and, and as you all know, it is still considered a human services agency. It is not by outcome focused on recreation. What they were put in place to do was to um, basically serve the needs of the marginalized, whoever the marginalized happened to be, whether that was at one period Black people, because again, in Fairfax County, we were very distinct Black and white population um, that has evolved over time. So the people of color, or poor people, you know, that was intended to be structured that way. So that's why their sort of their their, their uh, general fund business model is very much situated on that's what they were in place for. And because my, for those of you who don't know, my background is recreation. I I um, by training a, a recreation therapist. And so um, one of the things about that background that I learned is you know how recreation evolved. You know, just the idea of recreating and who who could recreate. So most pe poor people didn't have time to recreate, right? And so it was more sort of taking care of problems. You know, that sort of make, keeping people occupied was sort of the, the focus of, of, of that work over time or initially. And a lot of the programming of the park authority was beyond just the parks. <laughs> Piece, but the programming was really for people who could pay. And that's very consistent with, you know, nationally, just the themes of recreation. And so as you look across the history and you take into consideration, you know, this, you know, the, 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 the history of segregation in the nation and in our community, and then you weave in the evolution of our thinking about recreation, you sort of end up in this place and here's where we are now, right? And we have to unpack that, again, get to the root causes of the types of problems that we're seeing because of what this system is producing. And I think what um, 
the park authority has worked on with the consultant, um, the park my staff are working with the consultants and with the input from us and uh, from you know other is uh, I think uh, a, a great example for the rest of the county about really getting to what's going to work and what is aligned to our values moving forward. So with that, I go to the next, just flip the, the next. So what we did was just so you, and this yeah. is not to go through, but um, into the record and everybody can look through, we went through from the origins um, through. So I encourage you all to sort of read through what Carla was describing. Um, one of the main points that I just wanted to make um, that I think it's uh, misunderstood a lot of times is that's two pages of FCPA history before the first rec centers were built. It's really important to know that we existed and we were created as an authority to protect parkland. Um, and it, what we weren't necessarily created for the revenue fund evolved, didn't, it wasn't established until 1982 where we made that first tranche of um, rec centers. Then the next slide. And again, that was during that period of time when you paid for those things, right? If, if people want them, you pay. Well, but wasn't that also done because the Board of Supervisors didn't want my understanding is that we have rec centers mm -hmm. because the part the school system wanted to put pools at the schools at the high schools and that the, they said we're not giving those to you but the park authority could do it and the park authority said they're money That's right, right okay so in 1979 to 82 they decided to have swimming and so the school board um the schools the 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 county decided to add pools but they wanted them rightfully so to be community amenities and so as was the case in the 80s um, with government, it was make government work for you. So we're going to make this huge investment, which was five, as we all know, because they're now all up for replacement. <laughs> so it's a huge investment of five rec centers within five years that they built and they sold it on the whole. Don't worry, that's the only investment. It'll, it'll pay for themselves. And so that was fine. And then next slide. Then the revenue fund was created. And then the recessions in the 90s, the recession in, in, in um, um, 08, a lot of things shifted over. And that's how we got to this indirect cost that we're going to be talking um, a little about. And then um, I have the last couple slides about sort of NCS's movement. So what's kind of been happening is because of the revenue fund and the, the structure that we're, that Stan's going to talk, talk about and who we're serving, we have shifted, continue to shift in this one direction. And now that more people are recreating and it's more of a natural, um, um, everybody, no matter what your demographic, what your age wants to recreate, there is this huge vacuum. And if you go to the next slide, it's this huge vacuum that really other entities have now had to come in to fill. Um, that's why you get this sort of... Um, to be quite for Providence Rec Center, Sully Rec Center. That's not, I mean, community center, Providence Community Center, Sully Community Center. That's not what NCS was created to do, but it's a need that the community wants because they want to be able to use a gym for free. They want to have community rooms. And because Park Authority has, our revenue fund has not created that space where we can fill that gap. Libraries have yoga um, and fitness classes, free fitness classes. The other entities are going in to fill that space. So a lot of this work that we're doing is trying to right that ship so that we can sort of get back into our really great lanes and be able, there's no reason why we can't have yoga classes in libraries and we can't be doing stuff in community centers because we're the recreation. That's what it is. And the thing about, um, you know, in terms of the latest two um, community centers, the original community centers were schools that were vacated once schools were um, desegregated, right? And so those schools went to the community and turned into community centers, and that's what NCS managed. Um, they actually initially went to the community themselves, so there were community organizations that ran those, and then eventually that arrangements were made that those would become county programs. And so, you know, these, these latest two are the result of proffers, frankly. And so, again, I think this is one part of the conversation, what you all talked about earlier is another part of the conversation. There will be other parts of the conversation to just think about how do we best meet the needs of the county aligned to our current values. And so, um, again, I think that uh, the, the plan that's been developed is really intended to, um, to address that. Okay, we can go right into Stan.
Uh, well, again, thank you to the Parks Board, to Jay and the team for engaging HRNA to support this effort here in the county. Um, as background, HRNA is a national expert on parks and open space, uh, including funding strategies, evaluating, designing for equity. Uh, we also have uh, quite a bit of experience here in Fairfax County, uh, working on a number of issues from housing uh, to market studies in different parts of the county, uh, supporting economic recovery coming out of COVID, as well as looking at supporting the ongoing transformation of Tyson's. Uh, we were engaged to help the Park Authority uh, support its efforts to better serve its population, as Carla has just laid out. <clears throat> we all know the importance of parks, recreation, and open space. These benefits were made even more clear during the COVID-19 pandemic. Parks provide exercise opportunities, mental health benefits, uh, child care, community gathering space, and social cohesion. Uh, they also provide economic benefits. They're an important part of making Fairfax an attractive place to live, to work, to play, and ensuring that we continue to attract employers and residents that grow the county's tax base. Parks and recreation are also public goods. Much like our school system and our libraries, we need to make sure that everyone who lives in Fairfax has equal access to our top tier system and the benefits that participation uh, provides. We've seen these graphs before, but we can see quite clearly that Fairfax isn't serving its residents equally. 71% of summer camp families earn over $150,000 a year, whereas only 40% of the Fairfax population falls in that highest income bracket. The county population is 50% white, but rec center members are 79% white. And we can see a hint of the context behind these numbers in the bar in the far right. Uh, rec pack, which is not operated out of the revenue fund, is therefore much more affordable and able to serve a different slice of the county's population. And that really underscores the fact that having such a large portion of the Park Authority's budget relying on fees and charges mean that fees need to be high enough to support expenses that continue to grow every year. These high fees make many programs unaffordable and therefore inaccessible to a large portion of the population and hampers the Park Authority's ability to provide equitable services. I want to return to the idea of parks and recreation as a public good and all the benefits they provide. The Park Authority's funding model diverges from most of your peers and from best practice that you do not currently consider community benefits when setting cost recovery targets. For example, you might expect that an individual Pilates session or renting out space for a private birthday party, that residents would pay full cost for that. But an after-school youth rec program where kids can be in a safe environment and learn new skills, kids swim lessons, uh, where kids be, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> where kids can uh, benefit from health and safety, residents are also asked to pay the full cost of those programs as well. And as we'll discuss in the next slide, we're actually asking folks to pay more than the full cost of these programs. <clears throat> so now I want to talk a little bit more about why such a large percentage of the Park Authority's budget comes from fees and charges, and why your funding model forces these really high charges. As these models were put in place in a different time period to address specific revenue concerns, we're now realizing that they don't align with the county's values. Park Authority's revenue fund works differently than most other places, and that 100% cost recovery requirement applies to both covering direct program costs, uh, like the camp counselor's salary uh, or the basketballs, as well as indirect costs, uh, like paper towels and direct center restrooms, the computer in the offices, and the graphic designer to print out a flyer. Many of these expenses represent what is necessary to even say that Fairfax County has a public recreation system, that we can open the doors at the rec center, even if we don't have any programming. And we're required to have all of that covered by our fees and charges. This is really why fees are so high. Other agencies are very, fairly rarely required to recoup these indirect costs. And these policies were put in place, again, in a different time period to address specific concerns, but we're now realizing that these do not fully serve the residents of the county. Together, the fact that we ignore community benefits in many of our programs that we need to cover indirect costs, both of which are out of line with best practices, is what's making our fees so high. As you can see in these charts, 59% cost recovery looks really different than other agencies that represent larger populations at 17% cost recovery and the median of all agencies at 25% cost recovery. I'm sorry, can you go back to that slide for a second? <laughs> it just takes a minute to... No, can you go back? I'm sorry. Allison, can you help? So I was just trying to catch up on seeing it for the first time and understanding so the 22 percent under fcpa that's the indirect cost that was referred to in the other 
the other graphic. Are you implying there that NCS does not have to pay an indirect, does not have indirect cost regard? Correct. Yeah, because of the way it's it's set up, it's set up as not a separate authority. <laughs> um, and then is the median agency you have the population over two hundred fifty thousand? Is that larger jurisdiction? I was going to say that's the largest. I assume of the. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, when we think about implementing best practices to ensure equity, there are a number of uh, key recommendations. Uh, first, implementing a cost recovery pyramid that will reduce <laughs> programs for everyone, regardless of their income, in recognition of the public benefits that those services provide. Second, introducing supplementary subsidies to help lower income families attend all of our programs. Because we don't want to create a system where only wealthy kids can join the youth sports clinic that is getting less subsidy. If Fairfax Parks were to target the national meeting of 25% cost recovery across these recommendations, that would represent a revenue gap of approximately $32.4 million. We recognize that with all of the services that Parks Authority offers in unique context here in Fairfax, Perhaps a 25% cost recovery isn't necessarily the goal for you all. With a targeted approach to the cost recovery pyramid, we think you can rein in fees and make these services and these benefits more accessible to all of your residents. On this slide, we can see what the cost recovery pyramid might look like in Fairfax specifically. Personal training and retail sales would remain in the top tier, while items like general admission direct centers might target 20 to 30% cost recovery. And things like the summer concert series, which is so important to the community, would be free. Fairfax Parks is still working through what this would look like for you all. But the Parks Authority is proposing a modified implementation based on core areas with significant community benefits and health benefits, such as camps and swim lessons. There would still be public engagement process to determine final categories and tiers. The Park Authority estimates that this modified pyramid cost approximately $9.4 million to implement. Another important part of these when, recommendations- I'm sorry, when you say when when you say the $9.4 million cost, that's the revenue that would have to be made be made up. By adjusting the right, but that but that that's in theory the outstanding new balance that we would need somebody across the street to okay. Another important part of the recommendation is implementing supplementary subsidy programs that further help make our programs affordable. The sliding fee scale would recognize that even if a summer camp is only a 30% cost recovery, it still might be too expensive for some families. And a flexible annual voucher for low-income families will help ensure that certain residents aren't excluded from more individual benefit services like renting a picnic shelter. Administering these programs is quite costly and require coordination with other agencies that operate similar programs like the SAP. Sliding fee scales offer a range of financial support across the income distribution, allowing agencies to provide services at unsubsidized or less subsidized rates for the highest income households, while preserving affordability for low middle income households. Program based sliding fee scales can be adjusted to align with the program's community versus individual benefit. Sliding fee scales are a resource initiative to administer. This eligibility is not binary and requires verification of income. The Park Authority will likely require additional resources in partnership with other Fairfax agencies to administer a fee scale, as it's already been done for RecPAC and for SAC. The Park Authority estimates it would cost approximately $7 million to make a sliding fee scale available for summer camps, swim classes, and rec center access, but this might change after community input. Flexible annual voucher for low-income families will help ensure that even programs with high individual benefit that might not otherwise be subsidized can still be accessed by low-income families. The way this usually works in other places, such as Reston, is that there's a defined annual voucher amount for eligible low-income families, typically $200 to $1,000. There's a nominal entrance fee or co-payment per program to ensure attendance. And again, because these programs are expensive to administer, participation is also tied to eligibility for other income-verified programs, such as free school lunch or disability payments. The Park Authority estimates that flexible annual voucher program would cost approximately $3 million, but the exact amount might vary based on need and uptake of this program. Finally, underlying all of these recommendations of cost of 
administration and outreach, which is critical to the success of any program. The Park Authority must build out the infrastructure to actually implement these programs and conduct significant outreach to make sure uh, to engage the communities that haven't historically been users of recreation and programming. The Park Authority estimates $7.2 million for administration, software, and outreach costs to support these efforts. So in total, the Park Authority estimates they would need approximately $26.6 million in, in additional annual funding to implement a modified version of the recommendation. And these amounts, again, might slip slightly since they're estimated prior to extensive community and public engagement the Park Authority is planning. And again, I want to underscore that the last administration and outreach cost is really necessary to make sure that these programs and recommendations can be implemented. To wrap up, we've talked about the necessity to reduce fees and charges to improve equity outcomes. And in doing so, the Park Authority will need an additional 26.6 million in public funding, which is less than the 34.2 million would have cost to receive, to achieve 25% cost recovery of the FITS peers. Um, there may be other small sources of revenue that we can explore, um, philanthropic sources as an example, uh, but those other sources will definitely not be enough to fill the gap. <clears throat> Increasing public funding for recreation will allow the Park Authority to reduce its fees and charges, to price programs in accordance with the community benefits, and offer additional subsidies to low-income people. If we think about why fees are so high, that they are required to cover both direct and indirect costs, or indirect expenses in the revenue fund, if we reduce fees and change the structure of the cost recovery requirement, that does require additional revenue from another source. The good news is that many other places have dedicated tax streams for parks and recreation, uh, whether property tax levy or other creative funding streams, and these measures consistently consistently at high levels of, of voter support. I want to conclude with a reminder and discussion of what our goals are. We really want to make progress toward equity and make progress toward a public recreation system where the users match the county population more closely. 71% of your summer camp families are in the highest income bracket. 69% of your summer camp families are white. That's due in large part to the high fees that make recreation inaccessible. The recommendations that we made, implementing a multi tiered pyramid, so cost recovery is based on the community benefit, which lowered the cost of critical programs for everyone, and implementing subsidy programs through a sliding fee scale and through flexible household voucher programs, uh, which provides support for low income families, especially to the access of a full range of programming and high quality program in the county. In combination, these recommendations will make sure that fees are not a barrier to participation. We'll expand access to all benefits of public recreation, which public recreation we talked about earlier. And together, these represent an alignment with national best practices and correct for why the Park Authority's fees are so high to begin with. Our hope is that these recommendations, the first steps, very important first steps, to meeting the county's equity goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very familiar with Reston because I helped put, implement that program, the annual voucher program works extremely well. It's a very popular program. And each person in a family gets so much allocated to them once they register. And they can use that voucher for any of our classes, anything that the community center offers. And that just, just comes off the bat. And it's unrealized revenue. It's recognized revenue, but it's unrealized revenue that we see and that we've built into the budget. Initially, our cost recovery it was around 13 or 14 percent. And it wasn't, you know, what we found was is that really wasn't reasonable either. So we actually made a conscious decision, especially during the hard times, to increase that cost recovery to 25 percent, but to offer more in the voucher programs and such to make up the difference. So um, it is very, very effective. And we've probably been doing the voucher program going on 10 years now. Lynn would uh, remind me again of what our entire general fund budget is across the street. It's like 32, 33 million bucks. It's in that neighborhood. What's it? What is it exactly? That's about that. 32 million. So I guess it's about a penny, and what his initial recommendation is is roughly a second penny on the real estate rate. Penny for parks. Penny for parks. Penny for parks. Um, we're apparently we're getting a penny for parks. <laughs> I guess another way to look at this is that we could do all this and still 
uh, be spending percentage wise where some of our other neighboring counties are spending a bunch right now. Is that a well, fair assessment? It's a, it's a fair assessment. However, this is this is where this is where the hard decisions are made. Because ultimately all of the money that would be coming in would be to help our residents. It would not be it would not help us maintain our parks better, it would not increase the amount of you know money we have going to everything else what we do would pretty much be exactly the same minus the outreach. And so really it's the county deciding if they want to, as Carla said, have a different does this really reflect the values that we that we have, you know, right right this second. And if people can't afford, you know, what we're doing, then then that's a problem. To Bill's point, really if you look at the three pronged approach, the first thing, the pyramid is to deal with the fact that our fees are in, in a lot of respects, our fees are high for the average person. Forget if they're in an opportunity area, middle class, it is tough to, to afford our programs. This makes it easier and makes our programs more affordable as to what a government-backed um, direction system should be. That's the pyramid. The sliding fee scale is even if you lower the cost, people still can't afford it. And we're do and we can't afford all of the costs. And we're one of the only entities that don't have a sliding fee scale. And so adding in the sliding fee scale based on your income. And the sliding fee scale and the pyramid are based on community benefit. And so we're not proposing that personal training. And the great thing about our revenue fund and the great thing about what we have established in the last 80 years of our existence is a really phenomenal record department. And that was based on the fact that we were 100% fee-based. Other places that aren't 100% fee-based wouldn't have a water mine, wouldn't have eight golf courses, wouldn't have all of the stuff that we have. And so not everything would fit into that pyramid, but we don't want to tell people that, oh, these are the stuff for the normal people. And then only the, the rich folks can do golf and water mine and whatever. And that's where the flexible vouchers come in. So it really is everything talks to each other to make sure that we're really hitting um, all of the needs. So we, we, we need a full penny just to get here. And if we want to yeah, move we, forward for right. our mobility. So a penny for parks is not enough. No, no but it's a, start. it's a start. It's a start. It's a start. Mike? Two would be better. I've got a yeah, Two. two. <laughs> yeah. One more smart alley. <laughs> um, Ken and uh, Bill, uh, remember this guy, uh, in peril. Oh, geez. Don't go. But seriously, though, what did he used to say? What did he used to say? Yeah. We, we, we're running a country club. Yeah. Just interesting comment from 13 yeah. years ago. Right. There's a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> first, and again, a lot of this is in, in terms of the presentation, the information that this is new to me. I mean, so. I may have missed written in the whatever. Um, I don't think the program has a significant, Im a direct impact on golf, but for potentially the vouchers, right? And the reason I say that is at the same time, the vouchers aren't necessarily going to get them golf clubs. So so <clears throat> I think that that we should focus on the metrics we're trying to solve versus throwing in other stuff. And so I don't know, but more broadly, my impression, and, and Jay may have a different one, y'all may have a different one, everybody else may have a different one. I don't think this, this is a down payment on potentially addressing an issue. This doesn't solve the issue. This doesn't get us a playground in a community that doesn't have playgrounds where there are playgrounds someplace else. And I think that's important to consider because all those other things cost lots of money too. And my concern about this presentation is the idea that, oh yes, this is the solution. We need to go do it because this solves the problem. And I, I just, I look at the sports tourism task force that Bill and I are on and the consultant did a study and the study gets posted. All of a sudden everybody's like, that's definitive. It's not. that Those are some recommendations and thoughts and got to be baked in with other stuff. I think one of the things that that we're going to have, that we as a board have to do is take this, 
but bake it into the other pieces of what need to be addressed financially. Because going across the street and saying, yeah, we need we need an extra 20 whatever million annually to do this. And then next year go on top of that stuff we got last year, we also needed this. And by the way, our bond, if you want us to keep the rec centers open, not only are we going to need that, but we're going to need an extra chunk on top of the bond. There, to a certain extent, I think we have to recognize that we need to be thinking about that broader implication because one of the things that struck me with some of this, and and I, I will say, I, my parents moved into Fairfax County. I was less than a year old. I grew up in the county. I grew, I grew up in Burke. Lived there literally. My live there now. Still there. Lived two hundred yards from the house I grew up in. Um, making rec centers more affordable is great, except for the folks that can't get to them. Right. And and, and so. Absolutely. And, and so that's the that's the missing link well, I, in, in everything that we do is the transportation component, not just yeah. transportation. I would argue also the fact that that depending on the kinds of things that we're talking about, I mean, it may be transportation for a rec center, but it's not transportation for a soccer field necessarily. It, it may be that we have to get the soccer field into the community. I just we have to be thinking about all those other pieces and I'm concerned, and I just, I note that while this begins to address certain pieces, there's a lot of other pieces, and those pieces have huge dollar figures attached to them also. Sure. And and so I would just, I, I just know the, I don't know what the right words are, but going in and saying, we need this, and it solves it, it doesn't. So, uh, and when All we talked about before, we're going to do a, um, just in one sec, to, to um, a next step slide, is, you know, it did not take us four years to get here and it's not this is I not agree. a proposal for uh 30, 32 million this i mean this might take us a decade okay so this wasn't a oh let's go make the request this is not no okay the next step <laughs> i is, assumed sorry, it was a and I was just writing it down the, next step. the next steps are after this we're gonna and i mean the it. other sorry just yeah. the other piece of it is this was this narrow sliver of it was what was specifically requested by the board right so it, the first no, thing I, they wanted was so that's why there's no broad it's not that Stan didn't do his and job. Bruce is going to do this stuff. Sure. Okay. But but this also go from this to the public, we're going to put it out for public comment about the pyramid and ask the public what they what they think. We're going to take it to the board of supervisors. We're doing intensive community outreach, and then we're going to hear what everybody else has to say and come back, work across the street to propose a um, implementation plan. So this is not an FY twenty five budget ask okay. thirty two million dollars. This, this is not even anything. This is nowhere in this budget ask. <laughs> okay. In general, this is that helps. I'm, 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 right. Okay. And the other thing that you're saying, it's you're absolutely right, and you know, kind of to what Carla was saying before, this is when all of the little um, webs sort of start to connect, right? So what you're saying, absolutely, prosa. That's why we have prosa. We're we're breaking down the silos for. Um, NCS and Park Authority with Rec Pack because everybody can't come to our rec center. So we need to be able to go to them. And if we can break this down, we can have the same, we can have a splash and explore camp that meets at Kathy Hudgens Community Center. And then they drive over to 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 um um what am I? Lake Fairfax. We can do all those things if we if you. we fix sort of this big rock and and we can do that. We can have stuff in libraries. We can look at um, people's travel and really be bringing stuff to them on the recreation front that we can't really do right now unless it's going to make us all of the money that that um, that we have. We need to be all of those things are all tied in. And if you look at all of the stuff that we're sort of working on with our strategic plan, our equity action plan, and this and the rest, it all starts to like tie in together. And you can kind of see that big sort of picture, the Sully um um, experiment that we did at Sully Community Center to really see how does that look? What would it look like if we were to target? That wasn't just two sides of the gym and our um, our park services just opened up the doors and said, come in. They had to have, take a very strategic approach about finding the community and most need and going out and getting them and bringing them to the camps, both transportation and location. So it, that's that admin fee 
is it's not just the person behind the computer who can verify income, but we have to go tell people that it is. We have to work with NCS to hold um, particular camp things. Who who are people in, in need? How are we going to get them? All of that things to just to make sure that we're moving that need. So the the one thing I would so I take into consideration as we go through that is that as we take this to the public, it begins to establish a, a, kind of like a master plan sometimes does. It establishes the, here's what you want to do and here's what you're going to do. And it may be that at a board meeting similar to this in six months, in a year, when, I, when we're working through budgets, whatever, we say it is for equity reasons, we want a mobile nature center. And that that's critically important to have a mobile nature center, which means we may not do something that's item 17 on the list of things that come out of this. I have a mobile nature center. It, but I, I'm just saying. That's the community outreach. So, so this right now, we're taking our consultant's recommendation. We took our first stab at throwing something out there as far as the pyramid. We did not think that the traditional pyramid would work in Fairfax County only because, quite frankly, to pat ourselves on the back, the the... The, the, the depth and the phenomenal nature of our services. That didn't really work. So we said, okay, this is what we kind of think, but let's go out to the community. What do you value? What do you think is a community benefit? What are the things? And that might completely change once we actually hear from people as to what they value. We're going to reconcile all of those things. Probably not going to be coming back with any kind of um report back until fall. Pro I mean, this is, again, it did not take a year or three months to get us here, I'd rather go three steps in the right direction than 15 you know, miles in the complete wrong direction. And so we really are working across the street to try to figure out how to make this sustain both sustainable and have some sort of an, but, an I, I but, think it would only benefit us though to politely point out some of the things that this does not address, mm -hmm. like distribution. All this does basically is fix our fees, mm -hmm. our fee structure. But we really need to point out it does not address the post prosa distribution of parks and the other things that this does not address. Um, we don't want to give the idea that this fixes everything. Um, I think the more that we politely point out what this doesn't fix can only help us fix this a little faster well, and i think the board at of least have it in the proper perspective the board of supervisors i think that's that i get that kind of, I, i'm still back on though that when we're communicating to the public which it, it, it's important that we not it, I keep thinking about master plans. I'm always the person who stands up at a master plan thing in Springfield and says, listen, we're talking about what can go. We're talking about what's planned, but none of it's funded. We, it will take us time to figure this out. We we will, and I have that conversation and try to try to right size the expectations of the community. I think it's important that when we're taking this out, this this addresses one piece of it. We don't know the rate at which we'll be funded. And there may be other things that, because PROSA, only gives us a tool it doesn't provide us any of the money I mean, but i so i just i'm concerned about the right sizing the pieces with the, but, but with the community. No, no no i think, I think that's we a, will. it's a very good point and and it's and it's a conversation that i just had um last week is we are so large and the advocacy and the interest and the you know desire from communities are so far reaching that you can hit one thing and that doesn't that doesn't mean that they're going away. So you know we talk about we can talk about the sports groups, right? That's great. We need to do that. The environmental advocacy group is not going to look at that and say, right. "That's great. I'm I'm good." <laughs> right? You have to go to them. And then we've got the equity piece, and there's so many other pieces that the maintenance, you know, issue fixing our equity problem isn't going to solve our maintenance issues with taking care of parks. And so it's really is, we have to, and that's part of the other part of the reason is if you told me that we could have $30 million right now and that's all we get for the next decade, I'm gonna pass. Because we have so many other things that we need to do. We need to figure out how we're sprinkling. We gotta sprinkle across all of the things as we're building everything up so that we're solving all of the all of the problems. Or at least addressing them, if not, oh, I don't know that we'll solve them. Or at least them. addressing them for <laughs> two seconds. Yeah, I, this gets back to the uh, community outreach, which has been touched on. But uh, I don't think we, we cannot underestimate the importance of that. 
because not just on a one-time basis or a periodic basis, but ongoing. Because we've had other uh, uh, proposals, and, and I'll point to the the fee increase proposal. We do regularly. The the public response is minimal. But do they? Are we reaching the right people? Exactly. Uh, because every year, I think since I've been here, uh, we've we've had fee proposal increases, and again, we're lucky to get a dozen people. Except for photography fees. <laughs> we got six. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are exceptions, uh, but I think it's important to make sure that the that we're reaching the right people. We are going to be doing this. Basis. Um hugely high-end um, uh, public outreach. This is not Tuesday. Do you have a slide on that? You mentioned that you had. No, we will have a slide. You will have a slide. Um, it's part of the, uh, do we have a slide on that? We don't have a slide on that. Um, as part of the um, um, working with, NC again, working with NCS, they have a new um, uh, employee, and oh, it's what's outreach. it called? Outreach, community outreach. Inclusive. We have Thank it. you, what's yeah. it called? So to this point, I mean, I think across the board, not just for your meeting, but for a community outreach is sparse. And when we do have it, it tends to be the same voices that we hear, right? And so for this, I think, again, you were probably legally mandated to do something, and you'll do that. But in addition to that, utilizing our inclusive community outreach framework, yes. which, and in NCS built into their structure is um, in <clears throat> inclusive community outreach infrastructure, you know, to work in neighborhoods, to, to reach people in different languages, to um, do things virtually, you know, outside of what is our sort of mandated traditional way of doing community um, and more than I would say, community engagement, public participation, like you, but that you have to do it this way. This is utilizing our inclusive community um, engagement framework and the resources that have been put in place to implement that framework. So on the public outreach part, and I'm focused on that because it's in the actual motion that's in the board item. It's both to approve posting of this report, but then the second half of it is for the park authority to begin an extensive public outreach process. Mm -hmm. So you're not showing what that is right now. And the only thing I've heard so far is that you're going to go do something. And then the next time we're going to hear about it in the, is in the fall. And I'm really not a big fan of that. That's a next long, year. that's a long time of not knowing what is going on. Yeah. Is, do you want to? Don't worry, you'll be speaking at a lot of the community outreach. Then. So, actually, <laughs> Maybe be careful what I ask for. We are um, meeting with NCS right now. We've had two meetings so far. They've offered their resources. Um, we're starting to kind of put an implementation plan together. Um, we have the framework right now, and we can bring that to the board by the, the next meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Gonna, okay. um, the initial um, step is to get this on the website. Right. It'll launch tomorrow, um, and then we'll get the presentations up. Um, and then we will, as long as we get that implementation plan, come back to us before yeah, right. yeah. that I'm, I'm, I'm done talking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Anything else? When does this go to the board of supervisors? It goes on Tuesday. So if anyone's available, it's 9 a.m. Right. 930. 930. Uh, First item in, uh, Whatever that eleven, that's what that room is. I will be there if anyone else is there. If not, it's there virtually, or there will be a recording. Check it out. Um, I think I'm very curious to see how the board of supervisors reacts. All right. Oh. With that, we are adjourned. All right. Twelve minutes early. Twelve minutes early. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. You're early. Thank you. Over here. Oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> We can't do that. We need to move consensus to move forward. Move consensus to move forward. Is there? Yes. <laughs> That's why he was always on time. Right, because he didn't do anything. He didn't do, he didn't do, he didn't do all the right stuff. He didn't care. All right, we are uh, in recess until about 7.30.
and everything changed after the fumble. The fundraiser didn't help the Springfield supervisor who no. stayed opposed. <laughs> yes, we know all about it. <laughs> we're back. Oh, God, did you ask a, a history question? I was a question. Of what? A woman that she met. That, you know, she wanted to donate to the park. All right. It's 7 30 or so. We'll call the meet the park authority meeting back into order. Allison, do we have any speakers this evening? All right, we'll get right into administrative items. Admin item number one is the recommended adoption of the minutes of the January 10, 2024 Park Authority Board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Action item number one, countywide action item number one is the recommended approval of the Planning and Development Division Annual Work Plan for fiscal year 24. We have a motion and a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That motion carries. In the Mount Vernon District, action item number two is the recommended approval of the project scope for the construction of a concession and restroom facility at McNaughton Fields Park. Hello. And the second? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That motion carries. Countywide, action item number three is a recommended approval of the Massenbrook grant criteria update and the conclusion of the grant application pause. Second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Countywide, action item number four is a recommended approval of posting the HRNA equity study for public comment and for the Park Authority to begin an extensive public outreach process. So moved. And a second. Okay. All in favor? Or any discussion? All in favor? Right. Any opposed? That motion carries. We have one information item this evening. It's the update on park operations projects, uh, July to September of 2023, as presented to and reviewed by the Park Operations Committee on January 10th. Um, two quick chairman's matters for me this evening. Just a reminder: uh, March 7th at 7 p.m. We're doing our uh, virtual Federation of Friends meeting. Um, I don't know, Allison, we have any more information on that at that point? Okay. When we have more, we'll tell you more, but just hold that date if you're available. Uh, November, December, I forget when, Amy, but we did an update to all of you on kind of Lake Akating status. And at that point in time, I said, Supervisor Walkinshaw was going to do a board matter early in the year to kind of move us forward on next steps. <clears throat> that happened yesterday. It is mostly, if I understand the board matter correctly, it's mostly a DPWES led process, though I'm sure we will be involved. Uh, the main thing, I think the main takeaway is the board has agreed to move forward with a smaller lake option, uh, something in the 20 to 40 acre range, something in the four to eight foot depth. Um, and what has happening next is they're going to do uh, a sedimentation study, so to see how quickly the lake is filling in. And they're going to do a feasibility study on the feasibility of the smaller lake. Again, the board matter made it sound like this is about a three-year study process. So we're back in a holding pattern, if I understand it correctly, for about three years or so. Um, I think we'll know a little bit more of the timeline. One of the it, by the end of March, one of the items in the board matter was that a DPW would come back with a timeline of when all these things are going to happen and how quickly by the end of March. So I'll give everybody uh, another update then. That's all I got. Jay, the floor is yours. Okay. All right, directors matters. So um, first, I just want to highlight, um, and I say it all the time, but it bears repeating um, over and over, um, while everybody was at home and hopefully snuggled in their uh, beds or couches, our ops staff was out making our roads, um, sidewalks, and parking lots clean. I think it uh, bears repeating over and over again that you know, our ops staff wake up at zero dark 30, leave their families, drive on snow-filled roads to come out and make our parks uh, safer. Um, and they do it with a smile on their face. Um, and um, it's just a phenomenal uh, thing with our ops crews. You know, we talk about a lot of the heroes or the superheroes, 
I will say, of the Parks and Rec and when it snows, really our maintenance crews are, are the best. So I just wanted to highlight that. And these are some photos of them out during the uh, snow day. And uh, one of the things I always like to note is, um, you know, a lot of people would take care of their own house before going out and taking care of others. You notice they're all standing in snow. They did not plow the yard and then go out and plow the streets. Um, that is just not the way that um, it goes. So I just wanted to um, really um, commend all of the ops uh, staff and Kim yeah, was out there with them. The area three, yeah, that, I think that we, yes, area three, there we go. I think the, the previous one had uh, Audrey Moore, right? Go back. I think that that one is yellow oh. jacket. Huh? The yellow jacket. That's that's which one? Oh, there was there was a there was an object. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, so summer camp registrations. And I'm almost gonna make Josh sit here. Dub just play first thing. No, he's he's great. I just tease him all the time. So the good news is, as if you knew, um, summer camp registration opened on Tuesday at nine o'clock. Um, in theory. Um, so the good news was that almost 23,000 individual camp registrations happened on our opening day, which is up 30% from last year. Last year, we were talking about a whopping $5.5 .5 million we did the first day. We did $7.3 million. Wow. Because what I, I think it's like two o'clock in the afternoon, it was like 6.1, um, $7.3 million in one day um, for summer camp. Um, there's still a lot of camps that are out there. We have 17,000 um, available spaces that are that are left. So how does that significant... number compare to what? Do we know how that compares to last year, Josh? About 10,000 spaces. You're saying the available spaces? Yeah. Is that more? About 30,000 Now, how many do we have left last year? Yeah. Here at this time, I, I don't know. I'm just curious if all the other numbers are good if that one is too. We but we increased the total number of available slots by 33 percent. No, the amount of slots that registered today was up 30 percent from last year. No, what he's saying we went from we went 30, 30, 000. 30 000 to 40, oh, thousand yeah, yeah. total slots available. Okay, I got it, I got it. So it just highlights the fact that um, you know, our camps are in really high demand, which leads us to our significant challenges. I'm going to admit it was not exactly my finest hour. <laughs> Um, in general, so that's my apology to staff because I am also it's like the 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 uh, pair plug commercials. I'm not only a uh, executive director, I'm also a client. So I too was online at nine o'clock in the morning registering my children for camp when the system crashed. So that's a significant challenge. So in the first 10 minutes, our vendor reported 50,000 hits to our registration platform. Just, just to give you a little um, idea of how many that is, if you just look at the demographics for the FCPA, uh, FCPS touts, there's roughly 440,000 um, households in the county. So the 1.2 million is 440 households roughly. And the households that have kids is about 144 school age kids. So 144,000 households. So 50, one third of the households with school age children were hitting return <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. And it wasn't working. Um, Sarah is absolutely, um, and everybody else is absolutely on it, talking to, um, I don't know, you, you can talk about that if you if you um, want to. We actually crashed, tell me from, the system crashed that and we crashed the county website. So if you were trying to get on the county website at nine o'clock, that also um, crashed the county um uh website but <clears throat> when you're doing it and you're clicking and it's not working in your mind this is the how not my finest hour is that like everybody else is getting in but you right so you think it's just me and I'm, you're hit and return you're hit and return but once you made it through um it was it pushed everybody back and so i think that once everything started to come up and and it um Registration started to happen as I'm texting everybody. My neighbor literally knocked on my door at 9, 10, when I'm screaming out the window because my office is next to the front. Try, you know, I'm trying to, you know, it was uh, by my mom friends. It is, it is a really, you know, people who don't believe us that it is a really serious hour in Fairfax County, that hour that camps, you know, open up. But it also is a, te a testament to how popular our um offerings are and how important it is back to the earlier conversation to break down a lot of those silos we can provide more spaces in more places um for people i don't know if you want to say anything else sarah 
Uh, we're actively working with our vendor um, to resolve the issues because we have a spring registration next week. Um, so there was there was a glitch in the system um, that they've said they repaired um, as of two o'clock today. We're not hearing as many complaints or any. So it, it's better, but it, um, it was bad yesterday. Yes, and it was not Josh's fault at all, even though it was his first week or two. Well, he left the position, he left right? The position, <laughs> right, that's the problem. <laughs> so now he's like, no, it's the other person's. So uh, next slide, is that it? Oh, um, that's just more of detail. detail. Okay. We, don't, we don't need to go into that. No, no. <laughs> By 1045, Jay's hair turned red. Um, uh, so general follow-up, as, as Sarah said, we're working with the vendor um, and we really are, we're going to be looking at some long-term solutions. This, this is not sustained. I don't know that there's any system that can cover 50, 60,000 people hitting return the exact same moment and have it go smoothly. So it's not an easy fix, um, but we have to figure out a fair solution that still doesn't get everybody on at this exact same um, time. So we're going to be talking about staggering or scheduled staggered reservations. Oh gosh. Bill Bowie. Is it a locally housed system or is it a cloud-based system? We got an expert here. Don't forget. It's cloud-based. Okay. mentioned that something that some parents, I'm not going to say myself, have done in the mm -hmm. past is that um, both parents and perhaps grandparents will also be all on trying to get, trying to log on to your, your, your mm -hmm. house to see who can get to first. So there is also that definitely did not happen in my house. Mm -hmm. I did not scream for my husband and get out his laptop to see if he could get in while I was, you know, while I was, uh, yes. Well, and, and, you know, I think that regionally, I mean, and this is not a solution that we're talking it through, but, you know, things like, can we do it by area, right? And do it like open up camps in this area first, assuming that everybody's going to be roughly, there's a, it's, it's, it's tough. We can't do anything where it's like A through F does it this time. Cause then it's not fair. Everybody gets it. You know, it has to be, you know, right. It has to be something that gives everybody the, the same opportunity, but just doesn't have everybody hitting that button at nine o'clock in the, in the morning. So there's a type of system where you increase, I mean, there are ways to make it work better. I mean, Instead of changing human nature, you may be able to change the system instead and make it work better, which I think is what Bill's kind of hinting at. <laughs> Bill, was... not that I'm not that we're telling people what to do, but maybe Bill's company can foray into <laughs> providing oh, right. rec registration, rec, rec registration, <laughs> conflict of interest. interest. But I'll be more than happy to want to add that. I'll be a big There are other there. vendors out. I mean, there. There are systems that let you win support when needed. I mean, these, these weren't Taylor Swift tickets, I guess, is the point. I, that happened a lot of people. That's they exactly, were. that's exactly <laughs> what happened there in terms of number, in terms of true numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yes, at, at, and for that hour, it was a serious. I think it, I, it was a very serious mm -hmm. countywide, um, issue getting calls from supervisors and everybody else because everybody in there, and their and their mom was calling. Okay. Uh, park services highlights. Um, our rec centers currently have the most active members ever at up 12 and a half thousand members. Um, September 2020 rec center membership sales were the highest monthly sales since 2018, 1.1 million. We keep joking around that, you know, at some point uh, there was a time when um, park services eclipsed golf in revenue. I think that that's their own personal uh, goal is to get back um, up there. It's really good that our rec services and our inside services are rebounding. I assume that September 2020 should be 2023. 2023. Yes. Yes. Um, he was really- Not 2020. Yes. <laughs> um, we had our open house and that brought new visitors. We had 396 in May and 242 in September. And we bought uh, $200,000 of new fitness equipment um, that we installed in some rec centers. And our sales team attended 24 events to promote um, membership. So we really are um, trying to get as many people in our rec centers as possible. Next slide. Oh, that is it. Oh, no, that's not it. Cut off the press. So um, for quite some time, we've been working um, on a potential land dedication in the Cub Run Stream Valley by Chantilly Premier Rezoning. If you are anywhere around the um, uh, 
um, government center yesterday. There were some protests about the um, data, it's called the data centers. That was that um, item, um, right? That was that item, yes. And so last night the BOS approved the rezoning um, uh, proposal with 67 acres in the Cup Run Stream Valley coming to us. Um, this will happen after the development developer survey and eradicate the bamboo and realign trails where needed. So it's gonna take some time and we will keep you guys updated on when the actual donation happens, but that just happened, so. That's 66 new acres? 67. 67 new acres. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Done. All right. Cynthia, you have anything for us this evening? I do not. All right. Faisal? Well, well pass one. Mike? I just want to thank everybody for not, I mean, it's not just the camps, but like you said, clearing the snow and stuff out, but also working with the different sports groups as they are trying to figure out mm -hmm. Their new seasons and access to, to to gyms and everything else. One thing I do want to highlight is that because of the work that I do with the athletic council, um, there continue to be concerns about communication with the school system that they bring up on a regular basis. It is nice to hear them brag about how easy it is to talk to the park authority and to get feedback from the park authority, et cetera, which I think is a testament to the hard work that the staff here does and working with with those groups who 15 years ago probably voted unanimously to not want to do anything with the park authority. So there's been a transformation in that relationship. I think a lot of it has to do with the way that staff engages and interacts with them. So I just want to thank them all for that. Linwood? I want to uh, welcome Joanna. Really nice to have a new face around here. Um, most of us, I think, have been here uh, some more than others, but I think the minimum tenure here right now is about five years. And, uh, I remember the last time we had a new board member, uh, last couple of kind of said statements along the, the, the lines of, you know, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I have a lot to learn. So I'm just happy to listen for a lot. And, uh, I just want to say, as I say uh, to them when they say that, I reject that premise completely. <laughs> We all kind of know what each other are thinking and what they're going to say before they say it. And your fresh perspective is very, very, very welcome. And even if we don't agree with what you say, I'm sure it will help our perspective. So welcome and, and please participate as fully as you can as fast as you can. And for the record, Linda called me less than an hour after I had been appointed and approved by the board of directors to lobby, to lobby me on a vote for a dog park. <laughs> <laughs> 12 years ago, he was my first hand check here. Yeah, you've heard me say that too. Fresh perspective is good. Thank it's you. been 12 years. So you beat me to the punch, I know I was also going to welcome that. Uh, you know, and, uh, um, and, and also yes. say uh, along the next lines that you have uh, big shoes to fill, but I think we've already gotten the impression that you are like uh, mm -hmm. like, There's a lot, so believe me. Like to ask <laughs> uh, intelligent yeah. questions, probing questions, and, that I came to. and add value to the So, nice to have you. Bill, welcome, John. No. And I did have an occasion to spend some time with my favorite congressman who uh, inquired about the status of where we are with relation to the 10%. And staff so graciously gave me that information. And I have passed that on to said congressman to see what he can help us do about clearing the hurdle. Clearing that gap. If we get to 10%, does he get another trail? <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> what are we at? Nine, five, three. Something like that. But over 20% of Fairfax County is a over park. Over 20% of the area is a park. Parkland, but we, we, we we're a little over nine and eight. Nine, four, seven. And? I'd also like to second the welcoming. And uh, I, I sort of worked up when uh, Linwood said uh, uh, said something about old faces. In my... <laughs> <laughs> Who could he possibly be referring yeah. to? I didn't say that at all. I said <laughs> only minimum 10 years, about five years. <laughs> but welcome. I think you'll have an enjoyable experience. And this is just a great group. Jonah? Thank you guys for the warm welcome. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm really looking forward to uh, learning more about parks and, and 
incredibly grateful to be working with such fantastic team and on such an important cause. So thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. All right, we Allison, make sure you, you, you get her away from Quinn. I mean, Ken, next week, we don't want too much of a bad influence at first there, right? Move her around a little bit. What did I tell you? <laughs> you said you were going to say that. Ken's a great job. All right, we have an election this evening. Faisal, take yes, it sir. away. Yes, sir. It's time. So let's get started. Well, a copy of the proposed slate for 2024 Park Authority Board offices have been distributed and each member should have received a copy via email from the director's office. The following names have been placed in nomination for this year. For chairman, Mr. Kyle Stone. For vice chair, Snacky Godbold. For the secretary, uh, Cynthia Jacobs Carter. And for the treasurer, Timothy Hackman. We can start with the chairman. The nominee for the chairman, office of the chairman, is Kyle Stone. Mr. Chair, I think you're the chairman right now. So, yes. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we accept the slate by acclamation. We cannot. We can't? No, yeah, we have to vote on each one. Yes. Well, why? <laughs> Thanks for trying to. <laughs> Just thought I'd save you that. Yeah. Well, I, do I forget that every year? I yeah. hope the nomination <laughs> can close for chair. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any name? Well, having turned done, I think so. Well, now we have to vote. We have to elect yes. Results. So, well, do we? Okay. All right. So, all, we already have that. So, no, we have to vote. We actually all have to vote. All in favor for, okay. All those in favor for Carlson for chairman say yay. Right. You have to actually uh, yeah, okay. Show of hands. I guess I'll hey, for Your hand. Because yeah. <laughs> it's got to be recorded. Okay. Well, I will tell it, and the, uh, the winner for the, the chairman for the board for two, 2024 hereby is Kyle Stone. All right. All right. Let's move to the second one. The nominee for the office of the vice chair is Maggie Godbold. Uh, are there any nominations from the floor? So I second that. Oh. All those in favor for of Maggie Godbold for vice chair, I say aye. Vote on that motion to close the nominations. Oh, who's going to make a motion? We already did. It's yeah, been so seconded, so, so now we have to vote. Call for a vote on no, the call for a vote. Yes. So. <laughs> no, on the, on the motion. So aye. aye. Motion to close okay. the nomination. Yes. We have the motion to close the nomination? Aye. Oh, yeah, it's been seconded. Yeah. Okay. We already, yes. Do we have a second? Yes, I second. Yeah. Okay, I second. Right, let's see the yeah, show of hands now. I second. All right, great. So we're gonna we're gonna see the show of hands now. Yeah, we can no, just say it's just a motion. Okay. Yes, let's call for the vote. All right, so just call for yes and call for the vote. Just all in favor of all in favor of closing. Yes, no, that we already did that. Well, yeah, all we already did that. All in favor of, of the closed of the nomination. Closed nomination. All in favor of the nomination. Well, all in favor of the closed nomination. We voted on closing nomination. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we did. You still got to vote. All right. Yep. Now you call for magazine. All right, magazine. The votes are tallied, and the vice chair for the board for 2024 is Maggie Godbold. All right. Now it's about my sister Cynthia. All right. So the nominee for the office of secretary is Cynthia Jacobs Carter. Are there any nominations from the vote? I'm not hearing that. Okay. Second. Second. All in, favor. in favor say aye. 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 So we have the motion for close the. We just did. We just, we just did that. So now we call so for all in favor. Um, all in favor. Uh, all in favor. So say her hand better go up. <laughs> <laughs> the votes are tallied. The secretary for the of the board for 2024 is Cynthia Jacobs Carter. All right. <clears throat> the nominee for office of treasurer is Timothy Heckman. Are there any nominations from the floor? I move that we close the nominations from the second. second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so do we have them? <laughs> All in favor of turn. Okay. All right, we got it. All right, so we'll have for 2024 is Timothy Hackman. But final slate for 2024, Mark 30 officers are Chairman Kyle Stone, Vice Chair Maggie Godbold, Secretary Cynthia Jacobs Carter, Treasurer Mr. Tech Timothy Hickman, Hackman. On behalf of the nomination committee, I congratulate the 2024 County Park Authority Board officers and thank the board members for their support during the nomination process. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Uh, All right, we will go into closed session momentarily. You got to close the door before she does her motion. Or read, read, do motion Cindy, you have a motion for us? Yes, I do. We're all set? Yes. Yep, we're waiting. I move the Park Authority Board recess and convene in closed session for discussion and consideration of matters enumerated in Virginia Code 2.2-3711 and listed in the agenda for this meeting as follows. A, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of publicly held real estate for a public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A3 and A6. Cynthia, if you could read the next line, please, in italics. Response to request for information relative to the development of sports tourism facilities. Tim Hackman, I second the motion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. As soon as that door closes, we're all good online. Cynthia. I move the Park Authority Board return to open session. I second. Can we all in favor? Do we have to have the doors open first? No, you don't have the doors open. Not yet, not yet. Not it's yet. after the Sorry, it's after. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that, it, it can't be open to come out of closed session. All of these questions. But we're not but we're not in close but we're not in closed session until after the vote. Okay. Okay. That's why I was asking. Anyway, all right. Call I, I that. There's no one out there. So. <laughs> just going by the books. All right. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? That motion carries. And I'll, then I'll call for certification of topics discussed in closed session. Cynthia, you have a motion? I move the Park Authority Board certify that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under Virginia Code 2.2-3712 and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the board. I have a nice second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Anybody else have anything for the good of the order? All right, we are adjourned. See you all in February. So, so what it works, at least we understand what she's saying. Finally. Yes. <laughs>